The red dragon and the gold is what I have been looking forward to the most this season. An epic dragon battle that changed things for both sides and left Team Black without one of their biggest dragons and most experienced dragon riders. It was a fantastic sequence and a great episode overall. And as always, there is a lot to talk about, including some highly questionable character choices. Hey everyone, I'm Mariana, this is Impression Blend, and welcome back to another House of the Dragon episode breakdown and review. I will talk about everything that happened, what worked, what didn't, how it all compares to the book, Fire and Blood, and answer some of your questions as well. Naturally, spoilers for this episode and everything leading up to it, but no spoilers for any of the future events from the book. Let's get into it. Before we get into our big awesome battle though, let's talk about everything leading up to it. We open with Damon at Heron Hall, where he continues seeing things and getting haunted by his past and his conscience. So remember how last week I said Heron Hall was my favorite part of the episode? Well, this time around, I'm sad to say it's my least favorite, and it's a bit of an overkill in my opinion. I feel like my concerns about the show keeping Damon at Heron Hall for the rest of the season are not unwarranted. First, he sees Rhaenyra in the throne room, which is a reversal of the scene from season one where we first see them on screen together. Despite Damon's support for Rhaenyra, we're now suddenly implying he wants the throne for himself, which to me is not an earned development for this character. We later see him hallucinating Aemond, who is also Damon, which is fitting considering they're pretty much two sides of the same coin. We see Damon talking to Alice Rivers, where we get some more interesting spooky lore, and once again, Again, it's hard to tell if this interaction is real or not because she gives him a potion to drink that for some reason he drinks. Can I just say that if I were Damon, I would not accept anything this woman gives me to eat or drink? Absolutely not. All of this is way too weird and suspicious. But Damon accepts and somehow teleports to a meeting with Sir Willem Blackwood, who is the kid we see in season one presenting himself as a potential husband for Rhaenyra. What a glow up. But Damon is still hallucinating in this scene as well. To me, this was a bit much, and it was hurting the pacing of the episode, which some of you brought up as well, saying that the pacing felt off, particularly in the first half. I need Damon out of this haunted castle as much as I am enjoying the spookiness and the lore. I'm also not on board with the show suddenly trying to act like, ooh, maybe Damon is going to betray Rhaenyra and steal the throne for himself. Just stop. He had plenty of opportunities to go that route throughout the series, and it's clear that's not what his character is about. He wants to be important, he wants to be feared and respected, he wants to be the baddest boy of the Seven Kingdoms, but the Iron Throne is not what he's after, and the writers are for some reason trying to make this a thing this season. It's extra drama I don't need, and so far that's also what they're using Alice Rivers for. One of you put it really well. I hope they move away from all of the dream sequences with Damon. It feels like they're trying to do a character study on a character who is more interesting when executing his decisions. Yes, a hundred percent. I, of course, love some character introspection, and it is interesting to see those moments of Damon processing something or briefly questioning the situation, but the key word is moments. Currently, the balance is off for me, and chaotic Damon is absolutely more fun to watch. Also, a quick Easter egg before we move on. Fairy Kingdom 86 asks, did you get any significance to that random black ram that Damon passes in the halls of Heron Hall. Am I overthinking it? I kept thinking about something like the witch where the black ram is symbolic of the devil and evil. I'm not going to lie, Black Philip was also my first thought because I love the witch, but the goat is a reference to Vargo Hote, also known as the goat from A Song of Ice and Fire, who is very important when it comes to Heron Hall centuries later. This character was replaced by Locke on on Game of Thrones for some reason. And fun fact, we see three dogs as well, which is a reference to the sigil of House Clegane. As Gregor Clegane captures Hall during the War of the Five Kings, 
in A Song of Ice and Fire books. But that's quite enough about Harrenhal, let's talk about what's going on with the Greens. At King's Landing, Alicent gets some moon tea plan B because nobody wants Sir Kristen Cole's babies and is very much preoccupied by going through history books and scrolls, presumably doing research about Aegon the Conqueror's dream, the Song of Ice and Fire Rhaenyra told her about. She seems to be questioning if Viserys indeed wanted Aegon II to succeed him, but then when she talks to Laris, she also says the significance of Viserys' intentions died with him. Which is it, Alicent? She might be lying, but I am convinced that the show doesn't know what to do with her character at this point because they have gotten themselves into a corner of keeping her very passive. Remember Alicent from season one who was ready to take Rhaenyra's eye out for Aemond and told Viserys, You may do as you wish, husband. When I am cold in my grave. Yeah, can we have that Alicent back? But I will say, as much as I don't like Alicent this season, I did really like all of the King's Landing scenes. Her scene with Laris in particular really took me back to that season one Alicent who had more fight in her. And I love their exchanges because they always have a double meaning in them. The council scenes are great too, with Aegon being rightfully frustrated he's not being properly informed about the plans and strategies as he finds out that Kristen Cole is marching on Rook's Rest after adding to his army. We see that Aemond is clearly working with Cole on the entire military operation, while Aegon is not really expected to participate or ask questions, but the tension between brothers is also still brewing, which we see when Aemond embarrasses Aegon by speaking in High Valyrian, while I'm sure he's fully aware Aegon is nowhere near fluent. Though apparently Aegon taught his dragon English? Impressive. And then we get the heartbreaking scene between Aegon and his mother where she basically tells him he is worthless and just needs to sit there and do nothing. She is absolutely awful to him this season, completely ignoring the fact that her and Viserys' parenting and lack of guidance are the reason he is inexperienced and acting rashly. Furthermore, she's the one who pushed him onto the throne while he didn't even want it to begin with, and now his son is dead and he has zero compassion or support from his actual family because all they want to do is tell him he is incompetent while also scheming behind his back and not letting him in on the plans, shutting down his every attempt to be involved. And it seems that he genuinely does want to be a good king. He wants to do what's right and prove himself, but he stands no chance. I'm a little passionate about this, okay? I could talk about the tragedy, loneliness, and development of Egon's character for a long time, and Tom Glenn Carney keeps absolutely killing it in every episode with his performance, which makes me like his character more and more, even though Damon is still my favorite character and I don't think that's going to change. But I just want to point out that Aemon and Kristen Cole keeping their plans to themselves when it's a major move for this war is ridiculous. Speaking of Cole, he is finally being useful. People are still going to hate him, I am sure, but credit where credit is due, he's successfully growing the army and winning strategic locations for King Aegon, his plan to cut off Dragonstone on land is working, and him and Aemond plan a successful trap for one of Team Black's dragons at Rook's Rest. As Laris puts it, Sir Criston wins every challenge he faces. We do see the aftermath of his advance, particularly at Duskendale, where he beheads Lord Darklin for refusing to bend the knee to the king, and the way all of this builds up to the battle at Rook's Rest is done really well in this episode. He also finally gets his book title, Kingmaker, which I'm glad to see, and they're having him earn it. I haven't been the biggest fan of his character so far, but I'm glad they're finally showing him as competent and effective, giving him important things to do. Although, as the Hand of the King, it's still a big fail on his part not informing Aegon about these plans. But you know, at least we're making character progress. As for Team Black, in the first half of the episode, Rhaenyra is still missing, and it seems nobody really knows where she is. 
Her counsel is growing more and more restless as there is no news from her or Damon, with Jace and Bela not really being able to keep them in line, but they do get some help from Corliss and Rhaenys. We get one more quick scene between the two of them and Alan of Hull, where it's heavily implied that Alan is Corliss's bastard son, and it seems that Rhaenys gives her blessing to welcome him into the family. But Rhaenyra finally returns, looking a lot more resolute than before. She now knows there's no way to avoid the war and she is finally ready to take action. I just want to say here, I am glad her counsel and particularly Jace called her out on disappearing and the insanity of going to King's Landing. You guys know how I felt about that after the last episode. I'm liking Jace more and more this season. They do get past this pretty quickly and move on to falling into Aemon's and Cole's trap at Rook's Rest, deciding to send Rainies on Melee's to sort things out there. Jace isn't happy that his mom is not letting him go do war things again, but this is where she tells him about the prophecy, which I'm assuming Jace will actually take seriously since he had a conversation with Craig and Stark in the beginning of the season about the danger lying beyond the wall. It's a sweet scene, but I'm not going to lie, I'm getting a little tired of hearing about this prophecy. I don't mind them adding it to the story. I think it fits well, but they keep talking about it every episode, and that keeps reminding me of how pointless it is because of the last two seasons of Game of Thrones. I don't think any of us need to be constantly reminded of the last two seasons of Game of Thrones, but they insist. Not to mention, I'm still trying to understand why this important piece of information is only shared with one person at a time. This seems like a very flawed strategy. The entire Targaryen family should know about this from the very beginning and work together. But with that, we get to the battle at Rook's Rest, truly one of the highlights of the series, and particularly from the cinematic perspective, it's just stunning. I also love how earned this is within the story. All of the buildup, all of the political maneuvering, all of the tension between characters, it all led to this moment. I loved seeing how the show cut back and forth between Aegon and Rhaenys as they got ready for battle and their bond with their dragons. It was beautiful. I've particularly been impatiently waiting to see Sunfire, described in the book as the most beautiful dragon ever seen in the known world. I am very sad we didn't get to see him earlier. Technically, we should have seen him already in the show, and I knew he was going to get hurt during the battle, so... It's just a bummer that we didn't get to enjoy this beautiful dragon before he got hurt. But that moment before the battle between Aegon and Sunfire was so sweet and put a smile on my face. Vagar hiding in the forest somehow. Her stealth mode is unparalleled. I don't know how she's doing this. She is giant. I feel like even laying down, she would be taller than the trees. But she is so unique. I love it when she's on screen looking like the ancient dinosaur grandma that she is. I love that we got different perspectives of this fight. Obviously, each of the dragon riders, but also Cole's perspective, who doesn't miss the opportunity to turn Aegon's unexpected arrival into a moment of inspiration for the troops and the perspective of the soldiers on the ground, many of whom just end up being collateral damage because dragons enter the fight. They even did this cool signal chain, which reminded me of lighting the beacons in The Lord of the Rings. There's this awesome description in the book. The dragons met violently a thousand feet above the field of battle as balls of fire burst and blossomed so bright that men swore later that the sky was full of suns. I feel like the scene really captured the intensity of what these giant creatures fighting would be like. And later, when they crash to the ground, you feel the weight through the screen. And I have to say, when they show the dragons fighting each other, it does kind of look like they're dancing, hence the dance of the dragons. Very cool. But you know what's not cool? Watching these dragons get hurt. Something about that just feels very traumatizing and particularly awful, and we see all three dragons get hurt. Vagar is the only one that's pretty much fine. She can walk those scratches off. 
Sunfire, on the other hand, he's alive but is clearly badly hurt, and that shot of him wrapped around Aegon on the ground, still protecting him, just broke my heart. And Maylis didn't make it at all, but hey, Rhaenys and her dragon went out the way they deserved in an epic battle. The aftermath of this battle is, of course, horrendous and more awful than what we saw with Brackens versus Blackwoods. So many dead, so many severely burned, some completely reduced to ash. There's smoke and scorched earth everywhere, and this is what Kristen Cole wakes up to after being knocked out when the dragons fell to the ground. It's a big moment of realization for him and for the viewers of how horrible and unlike anything else, the war between dragons is. He really does look like he realizes he's in over his head because obviously nobody there has seen anything like this, and it's only the beginning of the war, I'm really wondering how this will affect his character going forward. He stumbles away looking for King Aegon and finds Aemond next to him sheathing his sword as we are left wondering if the king is dead. Honestly, Sir Criston looks more concerned here than anyone has been for Aegon this entire season. It seems like him and Sunfire are the only ones to show Aegon any kind of care and compassion in a very very long time, which is quite sad. What an ending to the episode. But let's talk about the elephant in the room. Cinematic Galaxy says, love the episode, definitely want to hear your thoughts on Aemon betraying Aegon. I do have some conflicting feelings about this because the show definitely laid the groundwork for this betrayal, but then they also left it ambiguous on purpose. All of the scheming behind Aegon's back was definitely a betrayal, but I know some people also saw Aemon hitting Aegon with that Dracarys as a purposeful attempt at killing him. But rewatching the episode, I don't think that's true. It looks like Aemon fired carelessly at both dragons as they were fighting, and man, that part is so sad because you see Aegon's excitement when he sees his brother turn into absolute horror. And I do hope we will actually hear how Aemond explains this to his family this time around, unlike what happened with Luke. In the book, this goes down differently. The two brothers are there together working as a team to ambush Rainies, and while the result is still the same, I would have loved to see those two working together. As is, it's pretty weird that Aemond was more broken up about killing the kid who took his eye out than he was about what he did to his own brother. And I also refuse to believe that Aemond is stupid enough to purposefully hurt a dragon and a dragon rider on Team Green when they already have less dragons than Team Black. But it's also also undeniable, they set this up to make him look very sinister in the show, so we'll see what he says about this incident next episode. My personal opinion, as a book reader, I would have preferred them to be a team. I don't love this change, but as a show viewer, they have definitely earned this betrayal and this ambiguity, so I am very curious where they're going to take it from here. I did get some of you asking about Aegon's fate, and I'm just going to leave that as ambiguous as the show did in the episode itself and in the Inside the Episode special, but regardless, it's clearly not good, even though he was wearing that Valyrian steel armor, and Aemond is next in line. Some of you were also wondering about Rhaenys, her logic, and why Team Black didn't send more than one dragon. That last one, I have no idea. Had they all gone, they would have won the battle instead of leaving the victory to the Greens. It's a really bad call, and I'm assuming the easy explanation is that they just didn't expect there to be dragons, but it's a war, and they should have. As for Rhaenys, the big question is why didn't she leave? Because obviously, after she saw the king was down, she 
could have left. At one point, it seems like she's just taking her time turning around on the dragon, but it also does seem like Aemond isn't really chasing her on Vagar, and she's far enough to leave the battle. In the book, the choice is a bit clearer. Rhaenys shows up, she's immediately greeted by two dragons, and even though she knows she doesn't stand a chance, she isn't about to turn around and run like a coward, so she goes down in a blaze of glory. Here, I think she understands that as long as Vagar is alive, the Greens have the advantage, so she decides to give it her all and try to take her down. She really should have just listened to Damon in this case, who suggested the two of them flying to take out Vagar and Aemond in episode one. Regardless, Rhaenys dies as a hero, and seeing Vagar, the unexpected stealth master, despite her size, close her jaws around Melis's neck is absolutely horrifying. So where does this leave us going forward? I think it's safe to assume most of the next episode is going to be dealing with the aftermath of the battle, just like episode two was dedicated to the aftermath of Blood and Cheese, but this one is a lot more impactful on both sides. Team Black lost one of their biggest dragons along with her rider, and in the absence of Daemon and Caraxes, that certainly leaves them in a bad position. I'm also curious how Lord Corliss will react to the news. He has lost his daughter, his son, and now his beloved wife. The Greens took a hit as well, even though they won the battle and have a war trophy to parade through the streets of King's Landing, so we'll see how that affects the Green Council and their war strategy. As for episode 4 and the season overall so far, I think they're doing great, although I'm a little bit worried they won't be able to top this first half of the season with the remaining four episodes but I'm sure it's still going to be fascinating. As much as I may complain even about someone like Alicent because she's a frustrating character it's not like her flaws come out of nowhere. We see that she's doing the same things to her children as Otto did to her, perpetuating that cycle of bad parenting, but she's also a character who didn't have the chance to figure out who she is or what she wants growing up. She is very different than the book, that's true. A lot more ruthless, a lot more motivated, but changing her age and relationships in the show changed who she grew up to be. Is it a choice made by the writers that book readers may not particularly love? Yes, and I do not love it, but I also can't say the show is illogical or inconsistent with these changes. Episode 4 showed two sides of House of the Dragon, both of which are equally fantastic. The family drama mixed with politics that is tearing this family apart, and the war with dragons in the mix. Both of these things lead to tragic results and fuel one another. It's like a chain reaction of consequences that just keeps getting bigger and worse, and the way this first half of the season has been building to the Battle of Rook's Rest really paid off. Even considering that I thought the Harrenhal sections were on the weaker side, this episode shines as one of the best of the series, but it's the patient buildup and the character development that make it as impactful as it is. But what did you guys think about the red dragon and the gold? Let me know in the comments below. And if you missed my review of the previous episode, I have it right here, ready for you to watch next. <laughs>